Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello, I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. We are doing Introduction to Chinese Study. Today is the final lecture, the 20th lecture, Soft Power in China's Foreign Policy Discourse. So we are going to end the lecture series with this particular lecture. Let us discuss what are the means of influencing behavior? So this, this uh, lecture would be a bit theoretical in the beginning. So uh, human behavior can be influenced using different methods. There are certain methods which are tangible, that is more concrete which can be seen clearly with our eyes and it could also be intangible which cannot be seen with our eyes which are very subtle. So, in, 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 it is a kind of a spectrum beginning with the most intangible and ending with the most tangible. So, this, this, this figure basically represents that. So, the most tangible form of uh, influencing behavior is coercion. When you forcefully make someone do something, that is the most tangible. Then uh, the next one is if you pay someone to do something. And then they are a bit more subtle than that, either you threaten someone to use force, instead of directly using force, you simply give a threat or you uh, restrict the ability to receive payments. So, so these uh, forms of uh, methods, these methods of influencing behavior are known as hard power. These are basically economic and coercive methods of influencing behavior. Then there are methods which fall under soft power, for example, persuasion. So if you try to convince someone to change their view or change their behavior, that is persuasion. The other one is legitimation. Legitimation means your view should uh, get some kind of a legitimacy. It should be considered socially moral or right. That puts pressure on people to conform to these norms. So that is legitimation. And then there is socialization. So gradually in the course of uh, many years, trying to influence someone, someone's behavior, that is known as socialization. It especially works on children. And then finally, the most subtle form of soft power is knowledge. So if you establish something as a truth, through a scientific method or through different academic methods, it is accepted as knowledge. And if it is accepted as knowledge and if people study and, and learn about it, they tend to accept it because that is truth. So these are the different means of influencing behavior. So based on this, uh, we can divide power into two, hard power and soft power. So hard power would be to make others do what they would otherwise not do. So, if you, unless you use force or, or give some payment or threaten them, they would not do that thing, they would do something else. But you make them do what you want by using these uh, means. Soft power is to make others want what you want. So, they would do these things themselves and th that can be done by either persuading them or uh, you know denying them the the legitimacy to do the other thing and forcing them to do what you want because that is the right thing to do socially and maybe legally then uh, so make them do something socially uh, or it could be basically knowledge so through knowledge you make people accept the truth and make them do now, uh, 
before we proceed we must understand what is not soft power there is a lot of misunderstanding of what soft power is so some people believe that soft power basically means a weak foreign policy an idealistic foreign policy which is not based on uh, military power but that is not the the reality soft power is actually a very strong foreign policy it is a property of strong states so when we talk about soft power we don't talk about bhutan or costa rica or some small uh, uh, country in africa although they may be culturally very uh, strong they might have a ancient civilization very rich cultural heritage so on but they are, they don't really have soft power soft power means you should be able to influence others and therefore when you talk about soft power we talk about united states china india russia european countries so soft power and hard power both are forms of power it is not about weakness so weakness is basically when you make mistakes when when you maybe have over reliance on your soft power say i have discussed about india china relations so in that pandit nehru's policy of uh, you know hindi chini bhai bhai so using soft power at the cost of hard power that could be a weak foreign policy but soft power in itself is not weak foreign policy then secondly some people say the soft power means cultural products so uh, cinema or food or this uh, these kind of things but the reality is it is not soft power so i can eat chinese food i might love chinese food i am eating chinese food and at the same time i, I may dislike china it is not necessary that just because i like chinese food i like china also so is they are not the same similarly i may like indian movies i, I can watch indian films at the same time i maybe i i enjoy them i watch them in order to find out the weakness of india to find how to uh, destroy india so even if say i practice some indian religion some yoga or something like that it may be for the purpose of uh, digesting those ideas and 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 uh, using that for the benefit of my own religion so simply liking some cultural products or popularity of cultural products don't add to soft power cultural products become soft power only if people become addicted to them or in the sense they they are so allured by them that they completely buy into it so so i i say i like indian spirituality and yoga so much as i am an american so i like it so much that then i become pro india so in that case it is soft power so unless it 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 changes the mindset of the person it cannot be considered to be soft power finally propaganda propaganda is also not soft power because propaganda turns away people sometimes being critical of your own country can or or your own systems and your own values or making fun of them can attract others to your culture people think oh they are so confident that they can even criticize their own culture or their nation or their government so that means that this this uh, country is very strong uh, say for example in, in china uh, the movie three idiots was uh, very popular because uh, you know it was criticizing the education system where students are forced to study in a particular field they are made to uh, memorize everything and write in the exam instead of being innovative in, in, instead of studying the subject they like so so it was a criticism of the indian education system but it became very popular in china and maybe chinese government allowed it to be popular because uh, it was a criticism of of uh, indian system but what what does it say that means in india people are free to criticize their education system in china that would don't that won't be possible or say the movie pk and th that also became very popular in china because uh, uh, of the criticism of religion but in china you cannot make such a movie and so it becomes attractive to the chinese similarly in the cold war also uh, say the movie 12 angry men was uh, was viewed in 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 eastern europe and the governments allowed it because it was a, it was a criticism of the american judicial system the jury system because you know uh, it it showed that it is very difficult to determine uh, if someone is guilty or not but what was the impression in eastern europe the impression was oh this such a robust system they are ready to discuss criticize so 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 this is a better system than the system we follow where we are, we are not allowed any freedom of expression 
So soft power is very subtle. It's it's not at a kind of a surface level thing. It's a very deep thing. Of course, it can be a surface level thing, but it goes deeper than uh, what we see on the surface. Now, in my research, I have basically categorized soft power into four processes: uh, persuasion, legitimation, socialization, and knowledge, which I have already defined. Some some examples of of, of these uh, maybe we can discuss, and then we, we might discuss the Chinese examples. So persuasion means to influence the behavior of other governments. I am we now we are talking about uh, soft power in terms of national power. Soft power can also be individual to individual. So you can have soft power in society. People may like you because of your personality and so on. So you can apply it to individuals also. But here. We are, because we are discussing uh, uh, China, we are talking about national power. So, persuasion can be applied on other governments. If one government tries to influence the behavior of another government, that is persuasion. So, that is diplomacy, the traditional form of diplomacy. So, that is done by the uh, foreign ministries or the head of states and, uh, and, and maybe some uh, influential people, say the Pope or or uh, for example, Queen Elizabeth II was very popular, or Nelson Mandela, people like that. Uh, they have the ability to persuade uh, governments to change their views. Second form is legitimation. So, legitimation basically lies in the international organizations. So, international organizations and international treaties. So, international law does not have any enforceable authority. For example, in domestically, if there is a law, then if someone breaks the law, we can go to the courts and the courts are going to punish that person using the power of the state. But there is nothing like that internationally. If a, if a nation breaks law, international law, there is no world government that can punish that nation. Other countries can come together and impose some sanctions, say like against North Korea or against Iran, that can, um, uh, you know, hurt the country, say in recent cases the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. So western countries have imposed a lot of sanctions on Russia. But still Russia survives, it's, it's, it, they have their own resources to survive and, and, and they can um, interact with other countries who may not uh, accept the, those sanctions. For example, India and China, they are trading with Russia. So in, at the international level, international norms are implemented through legitimation. There are there are costs to breaking the norm. So so every country may not be capable of doing it. So by making the alternative choice unfeasible or illegitimate, you make uh, other countries to follow what you want. So countries like America or China may force uh, some countries to follow their line especially United States, it is very powerful in terms of uh, uh, le legitimation power. Then socialization. Now socialization is not state to state. Uh, the first two you can say uh, are at the state level or the governmental level. Socialization is more in terms of the public. So uh, through cultural products, through NGOs and MNCs, by, by creating habits in people, uh, you gradually you create a culture. So, American culture, McDonald's, Coke, Domino's, these, these are popular all over the world. So, so pe people uh, gradually become used to uh, consuming all that. So, uh, in the beginning when, when these American products are not available, no one used to care about them. They had their own, own food. They would go to their own restaurants or eat out on the street. But once these uh, outlets are opened, and, and through advertisement, people come to know about uh, these American products and then they start consuming it and they become habituated. They say, okay, let's once a week or once a month, uh, we should try it out. And, and uh, as a result, these brands become very uh, popular and they start influencing our thinking. So in the sense that when we are eating from these things, the, the, these outlets, we start thinking, oh, so where are these outlets from? Okay, these are from America. So, America must be producing very good things. So, we have a positive impression of America. And gradually over a period of time, we become, you know, we start liking that particular country. So, that is a socialization process. It's a very slow and gradual process of influencing mind. And by influencing the minds of people, you are in, 
then influencing public opinion and then public opinion influences the government. So indirectly you are influencing the government policy the, because it's say in a democratic country and even in authoritarian countries, the leaders make policies based on what people like. So if people say Indian people have positive impression of America, then the Indian government will think if we have good relations with America, then people will vote for us. Say people have negative opinion about China. So if, if the Indian government then uh, uh, does not accept Chinese proposals, is hard on China, then they think they will win more votes. So public opinion influences government policy. So that is socialization process. But the most uh, subtle and actually the strongest form of soft power is knowledge. Countries that invest in knowledge production and knowledge distribution, they are leaders in soft power. So American power is not just about Hollywood or uh, Coca-Cola or something like that. It is about Harvard, it is about MIT, the Ivy Leagues, because they are producing knowledge and they are controlling the narrative, the international narrative. So uh, say what should be the social agenda? Should there be rights for the LGBTQ? Okay. Should uh, uh, there be uh, uh, a certain age of voting? Should age of voting be 18 years? Okay. These are basically social science research. So, so, so these ideas, where are these ideas coming from? They are coming from these elite universities and think tanks. So, so they are producing certain form of knowledge which then influences the mind of people. Similarly, technology. So what kind of technology will come out? Who decides that? It is decided by people who are doing the actual research, who are doing the cutting edge research. So AI. So America comes out with, American companies come out with AI. And so we find it useful, we start using it. So as a result, they are able to influence our behavior. They get information about us and then they can uh, you know, form our behavior in a certain way through knowledge. Social media, so there are social media platforms, news platforms, you know, that control the flow of information. So, so whatever information they are feeding us, based on that we form our opinions. Okay, so before, in the, in the pre-modern times there was religion, even now religion is very influential. So, so say the Pope, the Pope says something, then uh, the Catholics, the one billion Catholics of the world, they will take notice. Okay, they, they, they believe Pope is the representative of, uh, of God and so, so religion has a big influence. Religion has influence say, uh, in voting. Okay, some religious leader may in the locality come and advise people to vote for a particular political party. Okay, so, so, so traditionally there has been religion but in the modern times we have universities, think tanks, uh, news sources and, and the latest one is social media. So these are actually the most powerful sources of soft power. A nation which controls these uh, platforms uh, are actually the most powerful in terms of soft power. So because we are discussing China's soft power, let us look at uh, where China stands in, in terms of these four categories. Persuasion. So persuasion of course I can, can divide into different parts. Uh, one is bilateral summits. We see the leader of China, Xi Jinping meeting with uh, different world leaders. Okay, so he comes to India, you know, with uh, goes uh, with Narendra Modi goes to Ahmedabad and then sits on the swing. And so there's there's a meeting between them or they go to Mamallapuram where they drink coconut water or Narendra Modi goes to China in, in Xi'an and go uh, looks at that um, army, terracotta army. Or recently Narendra Modi went to um, America so Xi Jinping goes to different countries. So in this way, you know, bilateral summits between between uh, the the topmost leaders of the country, they are a very Im important instrument of persuading the other. So if Xi Jinping say comes to India, looks very friendly and comfortable, then people have a less of a negative view of China. People started saying, oh, China is not so dangerous. Xi Jinping is not such a bad person. Because he's coming into India, traveling around, going to places where we'd go, eating Indian food. So, so people ha start having a good impression of the Chinese leader. So China uses the bilateral summits to cultivate a positive image of their country. Then there are multilateral summits where more than two uh, leaders meet. 
so say the BRIC summit or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or say we will have in India G20. So these are the uh, uh, you know platforms where the world leaders can come discuss and they can uh, uh, you know develop some common ideas. So China uses this these uh, platforms very effectively, especially the alternative platforms that they, they have created, for example, SCO or BRICS, where China, China is basically the leader of these organizations. But even in other organizations like G20, China tries to play an important role. It, it intervenes, it, 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 it asserts its, its, uh, its, its positions on, on different issues. So, so this, these, these are the ways where how, how uh, persuasion is done. And then there is moral and charismatic influence of some individual. Okay, so in terms of moral influence, the example will be the Beijing consensus. So uh, there is something called Washington consensus, which is based on neoliberal economic policies. But many countries have suffered because of it. Okay, these are American policies. So some countries believe that this is not the right way. There should be some form of state control, and 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 so. China model offers an alternative. So China, because it, it's a, a regulated market economy, it's not a, a free market economy. So it is the market economy of China is regulated by the state. And so this can offer an alternative, an attractive alternative to others. So it's a moral alternative. So they can say, okay, we don't follow your form of uh, liberal capitalism, but we follow the uh, Chinese model because that model is successful. So you are providing a moral alternative to the dominant idea. In terms of charismatic influence, China has not been very strong. Chinese leaders or diplomats have always been poker faced. They, they don't try to express their um, you know, views. They don't try to influence people through their personality. Generally, that has been the trend. But uh, when Xi Jinping came to power, uh, his wife, uh, Peng Li Wan, who, who, who used to be a celebrity singer in, 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 in China, she uh, you know started traveling around with him and this this was the first first lady of china to be noticed by the international press and uh, she dresses very well and she's good looking and she's a celebrity and because of that she is able to you know have a positive influence on world leaders so you can see here this is feng li wan uh, with uh, his uh, her husband in in ahmedabad meeting Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So, so these are some of the ways you can use to persuade uh, governments. Then legitimization or legitimation is the same thing both the words can be used. So this China does and any country would do through norms and institutions. So in case of China, the most important norm for them is the one China policy. Every country has to accept there is only one China, that is People's Republic of China and the government of People's Republic of China is the only legitimate government of China and Taiwan is a part of China. So that is one China policy. So China has successfully legitimized this, uh, this norm. Only if you accept one China policy, then you can have diplomatic relations with China. Otherwise, China won't have any diplomatic relations with your country. And uh, China has been very successful. Now, um, I think it's, it's a dozen or, a dozen or so countries which actually recognize the Republic of China in Taiwan. Before that, it was more. In fact, before 1971, Taiwan was the permanent member in the uh, United Nations Security Council as Republic of China. But now, China has completely, or People's Republic of China has completely displaced Taiwan. So, this is a very strong norm that they have followed. So, this is Taiwan here. This is the rest of China called the mainland. Okay, so, one China policy says the mainland is the, is the real China and Taiwan is only a part of China which will eventually return to the motherland. Then another important norm that China advocates is non-interference in domestic affairs of other countries. What does it mean? So, America believes in spreading democracy. America believes that democracy is the best form of government and so, it is the duty of America as a democracy to spread democratic values all over the world. China says, no, this is not the right thing. You should not interfere in the domestic affairs of another country. Whatever form of government that country has, 
it should have the right to follow it. If there is a dictatorship, okay, that is fine because it is their choice. So, this is the way of course uh, of China to preserve its own authoritarian form of government. If democracy becomes popular, there would be mass movements and the communist party rule would be overthrown. Just like in Soviet Union, so in China also that could happen and therefore China says no, we won't allow any interference in the domestic affairs of our country plus we won't allow you to, or we won't interfere in the affairs of other countries. So, it is a mutual thing and many authoritarian leaders like this this norm and, and they, they, that is why they, they start liking China. China becomes more popular, it, it, it offers foreign aid and investment without looking at the form of government or the human rights record. That becomes convenient to many world leaders. Then in terms of international institutions, China was a late entrant. So, in 1971, they joined the United Nations and after that gradually, especially after the 1990s, they have joined many international organizations. For example, WTO, then they have formed the STO with Russia. You know, there are many ASEAN countries, they have formed the East uh, Asia Summit plus the BRICS, they have formed with Russia, India, Brazil and then later on South Africa. And the latest one has been the One Belt, One Road uh, of which uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is very important part. So, this A IIB is, is a kind of an alternative to the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. So, it is a Chinese alternative to it. So, uh, so, so it, it, it increases the popularity of China internationally because China is offering say loans at a lo lower cost and without any strings attached. They are not saying that you have to reform your government and so on. Those things are not required. If China simply gives you, you the money, there is a certain interest and you have to return the money in the due course. Uh, with the interest, that's all. It's simply give and take. While in World Bank, if you if you want loan from World Bank, World Bank will ask, what is the corruption situation? Is there are the elections in your country? Are the elections free and fair? How free is the system? Uh, uh, whether you follow market economy? Is the government uh, running things? So there are all kinds of questions the World Bank asks, which uh, many countries find very inconvenient. So this is the legitimation process. Then the third process is socialization process. So, this China does through mega events like the Beijing Olympics. Beijing Olympics was the biggest uh, extravaganza in China. It, it put it really put China on the world map. People started noticing China. You can see this this bird's nest stadium that China built the Beijing National Stadium. Very beautiful. These are the uh, mascots of, of uh, the Beijing Olympics, okay, known as Fu Wa and uh, Han Meilin actually designed these uh, mascots. So, then they are very popular, you can see in uh, McDonald's in China, this is, this is displayed, the mascot has been displayed. This was at the time of the Olympics 2008. Then there have been other ma major uh, mega events like for example, Shanghai World Ex Expo was held in 20. 10. That also attracted a lot of businesses and a lot of uh, people interested in uh, trading with China. Then in terms of tourism, China has a lot of, it is an ancient civilization, so it has a lot of tourist sites. So, people like to go and, and look at the terracotta army, they go to the Great Wall of China, they look at the uh, Grand Canal which was built a uh, thousand years ago, then uh, there is uh, the new ones are the Three Gorges Dam and they also go and see. Uh, places like Hong Kong where they shop and so, so China has a lot of tourist des destination and, and once China liberalized and opened up to the world, more and more people visit China. Similarly, Chinese tourists also go abroad and so that leaves an impression uh, in those countries about how the Chinese uh, behave. So, tourism is a very important source of socialization, both sides coming and going. Then culture, Chinese culture is very rich, Chinese food, you have uh, martial arts, um, then uh, there is feng shui, there is uh, you know this acupuncture, acupressure, Chinese medicine. China has a lot of cultural products and, and, and so uh, these uh, products people like all over the world people eat Chinese food and maybe they, they, they customize their Chinese food according to their own ta uh, taste buds. For example, in India we have uh, chow mein, chow mein is uh, Chinese fried uh, noodles. 
So in India, we put all kinds of spices to, to suit the Indian taste. But it, we recognize it as Chinese food. Then there's the martial arts. We, uh, we, we uh, you know, practice different forms of martial arts which, which originated in China. Or we, we love movies of Bruce Lee or Jackie Chang. And so, so in that way, uh, you know, ch uh, Chinese culture attracts people, socializes people. People started, start liking. But uh, as I indicated in the beginning, simply cultural products don't lead to soft power. You really have to be attracted by it. It's a kind of a door. Once you enter the door, you have to be locked in. Only then uh, soft power becomes effective. Otherwise, it, it, it's not really soft power. Then, of course, China has a lot of icons, international icons, and it has brands which are very popular. I already mentioned Bruce Lee and Jackie Chang. Uh, there are also brands, Huawei, uh, like Oppo, and all kinds of OnePlus. I don't, I don't even know which are Chinese uh, products. They are very popular with the people. People don't even know it is Chinese. But because it is cheap and, and efficient, people buy them. Uh, instead of say buying an Apple or Samsung, which are expensive, people for, buy Chinese brands because they are more affordable. So in that way, people become used to uh, Chinese products. So in that way, China socializes the people. And finally, knowledge. Now, knowledge stands on three legs. Uh, in China, religion has been used in the recent years to uh, not only gain domestic legitimacy, it has also been used to you know, have an impact internationally. So for example, Confucianism, because of a lot of social instability and social problems, China has reintroduced Confucianism after attacking it uh, under Mao Zedong. Then Buddhism has been um, on the rise because Buddhism gives uh, China an international foot footprint also. So they have something known as the World Buddhist Forum in which they use the Pancham Lama who is the second most important leader in Tibetan Buddhism as an alternative to Dalai Lama because Dalai Lama is outside China, is anti-China and so on. But the Pancham Lama is in China and he and that is the Chinese appointed Pancham Lama. The Pancham Lama who was uh, recognized by the Dalai Lama disappeared. So the 11th Pancham Lama who is the Chinese nominated, he uh, uh, basically travels around and, and promotes Chinese form of Buddhism. And there is this whole issue of Doje Shukden. Doje Shukden is a deity. Uh, and the Dalai Lama says it is a malevolent deity and, and Tibetans should not worship this deity. But it is popular among some people. And so uh, China tries to promote the worship of this particular deity because then you know, the, the opponents of Dalai Lama will increase among the Tibetans. The worshippers of Doje Shukden, they dislike the Dalai Lama. They call him the devil because Dalai Lama considers their god to be a devil. Then China controls any alternative religious movements. For example, uh, Falun Kung had become very popular in China with more than 1 million followers. But in 1999, China simply decided to crack down on Falun Kung. Although they were not doing anything big, they were only gathering in the streets and performing uh, these uh, meditation exercises. But Falun Kung was providing an alternative view to the orthodox view of the Chinese state, the, the Marxist view. And, and, and the Chinese government knows in China, revolutions have been led by religious sects. So if you allow a religious sect to, to, go, to grow too big, it could be a threat to the Chinese state. Similarly, Islam and Christianity, because they have their own alternative narratives, are also suppressed in China. So one million Uyghur uh, Muslims have been put into training camps where they have been taught that they should not follow Islam, they should you know, uh, eat pork and uh, not uh, fast on uh, Ramzan and all that. Christianity also, because it's a proselytizing religion, they are not allowed to proselytize in China. Christian church is uh, controlled by the Chinese government. For example, the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church in China are not appointed by the Pope as, as, he, does it, as he does in other countries. Uh, but instead, the Chinese government and has an organization, I think it's called a Patriotic Catholic Association or something like that. It is they who appoint the bishops. And then in terms of universities and think tanks, China is, is growing. China is investing billions of dollars into it. So, so Peking University or the uh, Tsinghua University are the most uh, recognized university in China. They are among the top 20 universities in the world. Uh, best in terms of research in science and technology and 
all other kinds of fields. Then China has been promoting Confucius Institutes all over the world. So these institutes uh, teach uh, the Chinese language and Chinese culture to foreign uh, foreigners. So you can enroll. Even in India, we have a couple of Confucius Institutes. One is the University of Mumbai. The other one is the in the Vellore Institute of Technology in, in, in the Chennai campus. So, so you can go there and learn Chinese and, and, and Chinese government uses these uh, institutes to promote the Chinese view of, of what the language, official language is because Mandarin is not a language which is spoken by all the Chinese, even, even uh, Chinese speaking Chinese. They are different dialects like Cantonese, but the official language is Mandarin. So Confucius Institute promote Mandarin. And so if you learn Mandarin, you write in Finnin, you write in uh, uh, the simplified Chinese script, you know, you follow the official version of the Chinese state. So in that way, it, it, it incre increases the soft power of China. Then it also partners with different Western universities. There are uh, uh, campuses of these universities in China with the collaboration between an, a Chinese university and a foreign university. So they come and I think there are about nine or I think about a dozen maybe uh, such uh, uh, foreign university campuses. Not the top ones, but uh, middle level ones uh, have open campuses in China. Then of course, Chinese students go, go abroad to study and that also uh, you know, uh, increases their footprint ab abroad. Chinese uh, students learn technology and sciences in, in foreign countries and they return to China and then use that knowledge to develop Chinese technology. Therefore, some countries have put restrictions on what courses Chinese students can take. Chinese students are not free to take any course they want. There are restrictions because, because they, these students, they, they take the knowledge and then go back to China and help China to develop technology. So they become rivals of uh, countries like America. And then of course, uh, foreign students also come to China and they are presented a very positive impression of China and they become, uh, many of them uh, support China throughout their life. And, uh, and with all these investments, there are a large number of research papers and patents coming out of China. Then finally, the third leg is news and entertainment. I have included social media in this only. So China invests a lot in uh, film and music industry. So it has a very strong um, uh, film industry, especially in Hong Kong. In mainland China, most of the movies are patriotic movies or historical movies. Uh, they don't uh, really make other genre because it's, it's not appreciated by the Chinese government. But in Hong Kong, you are allowed to, you know, uh, uh, make different kinds of uh, films and they become very popular. For example, there was this film called uh, the Shaolin so Sh Soccer where they use uh, their uh, yogic powers to play football. So that was a very popular uh, movie. Then there was the Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon. And so there are many such movies. Plus, they also make investments in Hollywood. So, for example, the movie Martian had Chinese investors. And so in the movie, you know, Chinese play a very important role in the, in the person returning from Mars. So wherever Chinese invest in whichever films, they have to project a positive image of China. And then China has, has their its, its own news outlets. For example, CGTN, uh, Chinese Global Television Network. Uh, it has, it, it, it basically, it's an international news broadcast agency. So just like BBC, it, it broadcasts international news. Then there's a China Radio International. Radio is not very popular uh, as it was before, but still, it, uh, there are people who listen to radio also. And then Global Times is a, is a newspaper outlet. And then to protect themselves from the uh, soft power of other countries, they have this great firewall of China. So you cannot open Google, Facebook, all these kinds of things in, in, uh, the, in, in China. There are restrictions. Uh, you cannot use Twitter in China because uh, uh, China wants to protect its citizens from foreign influence. They have their own alternatives. So you have to use Weipo or something like that. Uh, QQ and all Chinese emails if you want to use them in China. Yahoo. I think Yahoo is permitted in China. Although I am not sure whether, how long Yahoo is functional, but maybe China will buy Yahoo. Okay, social media, TikTok, it has been banned in India, but in America it is very popular. So this is the most popular Chinese app, TikTok. And there are companies like Tencent, which, which make uh, video games, which are uh, played by people all over the world. So 
in terms of knowledge china is very strong it is developing very fast you can see here a, a, me, a report of international social media you can see in the top 15 there is only us and china there is nothing else there is one tel telegram which is based from dubai but all others the blue ones are us the red ones are china these are top most used social media apps oh, of course this uh, data keeps on changing this was uh, the latest one that i had you, you can get the updated data also but makes no difference these are so us and china are the only players in this uh, this uh, competition okay so these were the four uh, categories of soft power and how china uses them to enhance their soft power now what is china's grand narrative what is china trying to promote what what is china which story is china trying to tell the world there are certain claims that china makes and, and there are some certain problems in those claims which China tries to hide. The claim, some of the claim of course are true. So China was an ancient civilization. So it has civilizational greatness, a civilization 4000 years old or maybe 5000 years old. So the Chinese claim that their nation has been an epitome of peace and harmony. They have not tried to he hegemonize other countries. Instead, they have freely shared their culture and their scientific achievement with uh, the neighboring countries. Okay, they always promote peace and harmony, unlike the Western powers or Japan, which has tried to hegemonize other countries. This is the narrative. Uh, of course, the reality you have to examine more critically, especially Chinese uh, behavior uh, recently. Or same way, ancient times, China trying to dominate over Tibet and say Korea. So, so those things have to be looked into. But in re more recent times, China uh, has not been very favorable towards peace, whether it's, it's uh, Chinese invasion of India 1962, invasion of Vietnam in 1979, or supporting communist and other ethnic insurgencies in other countries. For example, in, in India, in the Northeast, Chinese ha have been training uh, militants to fight uh, against the Indian state. They have been supplying them weapons or say supporting the Maoist movement in Nepal or, or the, at, the, at the same time they were providing weapons to the king ideologically and through other means they were also supporting the Maoists who were fighting each other. So these are some of the things Chinese do. So it is not all about peace and harmony. Then they talk about Changha's voyages. Uh, Changha in, in the 14, early 1400s, he, he took these large ships and, and uh, you know through the Two China seas, they came into the Indian Ocean and from, in, from the Indian Ocean, they went to India, Africa, Middle East. You know, Chang'e made these voyages, several voyages he made. And, and he shocked and awed all the local leaders and uh, he projected Chinese power, gave them some gifts, got some gifts in return. You know, so, so it was all about trade and diplomacy and there was no colonialism, unlike say uh, when Vasco de Gama or Christopher Columbus came they started colonialism but Changha was not like that. So that is true to an extent because Chinese were uh, isolationist and uh, towards the end of Changha's voyages in the 1430s actually uh, deep sea travel was banned in China because of Confucian ethic they did not believe that they should you know interact too much with the world because their culture is so superior they should keep it pure. Uh, some idea, similar idea prevailed in India also. So it was because of that, it was because of that type of thinking, not because Chang He was very uh, peaceful, because he, was, he wasn't. He intervened in Sri Lanka, in fact he used his army to defeat the Sri Lankan king and take him hostage and bring him all the way to, uh, to, to China. Similarly in Southeast Asia, he intervened and against the local rulers, he created a, a separate kings. Uh, so, for example, he played an important role in the spread of Islam in, in Southeast Asia. He himself was a Muslim. Then uh, they also talk about Confucian philosophy, which believes in rationalism and benevolence instead of superstition, genocide, which uh, say Christianity, Islam spreads according to uh, the Chinese. Which again is true to an extent, China, Confucianism does not really have a concept of a personal God. There is no... Uh, no uh, ad, uh, no law that they have to go and convert others and so on. So Chinese don't have that. In that sense, it has been Chinese uh, philosophy has been a positive 
contribution. But it has also led to backwardness and therefore Chinese people themselves rejected Confucianism in the early 20th century. So those aspects have to be looked into. Then there is a narrative of uh, colonialism, century of humiliation that we are great, we are the middle kingdom and these Europeans came, Japan came, they defeated us, they humiliated us, they took uh, our territory and land and so we had to fight against them. This is the whole narrative of 100 years of humiliation, which again is correct, uh, nothing wrong in that. So Chinese people had to um, you know, struggle a lot in order to get their freedom. And then uh, the Communist Party led by Mao Zedong came and they liberated uh, China and after 1st of October 1949, China is emerging as this great country uh, doing so good for its own citizens and also for the world. There we must see there are some problems. For example, we have the three T's, uh, Taiwanese independence and Tibetan resistance and Tiananmen Square massacre. So these are examples of brutalities of the Chinese state or, or say the demands of separation, everyone does not want to be with China. So Taiwan wants independence and it, it was expressed by Chan Shui Pan who was uh, one of the presidents of, of Taiwan. After that, it, the, the, because China has passed a law that uh, if in case Taiwan declares independence, then China can use non-peaceful means to address that problem, that means use of military force. Then of course there is Dalai Lama who is talking about giving independence to Tibet, giving its more citizens more rights so on. And then there is the East Turkestan independence movement in Xinjiang province. So all these problems are not really mentioned. They say okay Mao came, united China, China is one or China is great. And then China had the economic reforms of 1978 and in 45 years there has been peaceful economic development. Uh, and, and China has become such a great country, a great place, so all these things are there. But you must understand that there, are no, there is no democracy in China, there are no human rights in China. And there is religious oppression and oppression of other alternative ideological views. So the narrative is excellent, 4000 year old narrative, the great civilization and then we have a period 100 years of humiliation and then the return of China to the world scene. So it is a good narrative but there are certain gaps in the narrative. That also we should critically look at. Okay, in China, the term soft power has been very popular, uh, especially since 2004, because the Chinese government started popularizing it. These are, uh, I have uh, listed some of the uh, terms which are used for soft power and their literal English translation. Okay, they are I won't uh, go into uh, details of each and every term. And then there are some certain other terms which are again. Uh, related to, to soft power. Uh, one I would like to mention is Han Pan. Han Pan uh, was the office of Chinese Language Council International. So basically they ran, ran the Confucius Institute. Uh, so it was, it was an abbreviation. This is the entire Chinese term. I won't read it very long, but it was abbreviated as Han Pan. Uh, recently China has changed the name. It no longer calls that particular office as Han Pan because you know uh, there were some criticisms of Confucius Institutes and Han Pan was held responsible, that particular name or the brand was held responsible for it. So now they have changed to this new name, uh, a more neutral type of a name. I am not sure, I do not really understand the nuance of, of the difference between the two, it looks the same to me. But interesting that there are so many words in China describing this, this phenomenon of soft power. And then in China, there have been a lot of debates about what soft power is and how to apply soft power. You know, they, had, they, they, they came up with this concept of comprehensive national power. That we must not just look at military power or economic power, but look at power comprehensively. There are different elements of power together. They combine to give us national power and they call it comprehensive national power. So China has promoted this concept and there are many agencies in China which, which calculate the, the quantify the, the CNP and then, then compare different countries with that. And then it, CNP then leads to the relation between hard power and soft power. China believe, uh, believes that both go hand in hand and you have to use both. And then what is the nature of soft power, whether it is cultural or political, the, there is debate on that. Okay, uh, Tao Kuang Yang Hui I have already discussed in the previous lecture, so I will not go into it. 
And then there's international and domestic dimension of soft power. Soft power can be used internationally. It can also be used domestically in order to influence uh, your own citizens. Then in terms of strategy, soft power strategy is also China has adopted different ideas, new security concept, multilateralism, good neighborliness, peaceful rise and development, harmonious world, Chinese dream, and then the recently Belt and Road, and then Wolf Warrior uh, Diplomacy. In the, in the uh, previous lectures on, on China's foreign policy, I have already discussed some of these strategies, so I won't really go into them also. Now let's look at sectors of soft power. Now uh, we can divide China's soft power into four parts or, 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 or say public diplomacy is an aspect of soft power. So there are four sectors of public diplomacy, which, which public diplomacy are basically tools used by the government to influence the public opinion of other in, in other countries. And uh, so public diplomacy can be divided into cultural diplomacy economic diplomacy, education diplomacy and media diplomacy. Now in terms of uh, economic diplomacy, some of them, some people would argue that economic power is hard power, it is not soft power. But here I am talking about how through economic di diplomacy soft power improves. So through economic di diplomacy, economic power can also increase, but soft power can also increase. That means through economic diplomacy, you can create a positive, positive image of your country in other countries. Even military power can be used to generate soft power, say peacekeeping missions. If your army goes and does a kind of a relief operation in some country or they go and stop violence in some country, then you develop soft power. The positive, this is not military power. Military power means to invade a country or to threaten a country and force it to take a position which is uh, similar to yours. Or, or defend yourself against foreign aggression, that is military power. But if you use the military to generate goodwill, that becomes soft power. Similarly, if you use economy to generate goodwill, that becomes soft power. Okay, in terms of cultural diplomacy, China is uh, they win a lot of medals in the Olympics, they have invested a lot of money to China. Tourism, I have already mentioned, there are celebrities which are Chinese. There are Chinese brands, there are traditional products which I have already mentioned like acupuncture and Chinese food and all those kind of things. Then there are mega events like the Beijing Olympics. Recently there was the Winter Olympics in Beijing. Then religion, China also uses religion like Buddhism and Confucianism to you know, uh, influence public opinion. Economic development basically consists of the foreign aid and investment that China does in other countries. It also involves the, uh, the, the private sector. So it, it may not be a Chinese government which is invest, investing, but it may be some Chinese companies who are affiliated to the Chinese government. They also promote Chinese soft power. Then in terms of education diplomacy, Chinese universities are doing well. There are many Chinese universities in the different uh, ratings like uh, Times Higher Education Rating or uh, the other one was uh, QS uh, ranking. So, so, Chinese universities do well in these particular rankings. And I have already mentioned about the Chinese students in foreign universities, foreign students in Chinese universities and the foreign university campuses in China. And then the Chinese universities are trying to open campuses abroad. So, all these interactions with the world are helping China in its education diplomacy. And there are Confucius institutes all over the world. I think they are about more than, uh, if you include Confucius classrooms also, they are Confucius institutes which are university level. Okay, so they are, they are open in some university where they teach Chinese uh, language courses. But then there are Confucius classrooms also which are of the school level. So they go to the schools and, and teach young children Chinese language. So if you add up both Confucius institutes as well as the Confucius classrooms, there would be more than 1000 all over the world. I have gone through the list of, of the Confucius Institutes mentioned in, in the Chinese websites and when I have inquired in India, actually they have some agreement has been signed but they, they are not open. So the number is doubtful. And then I have also discussed media diplomacy of China, electronic media, print media, social media. Then there is the uh, spokesperson system, Chinese foreign ministry, there is the information department 
and uh, then the people go interact with the media they answer questions earlier chinese used to avoid that they are not very comfortable interacting with foreign media but the new generation of chinese diplomats are media savvy especially this phenomenon of wolf warrior diplomacy okay they even you know uh, counter the the journalist they counter question and they answer very aggressively so so the chinese are becoming more and more comfortable with media but still not as good as say uh, the democratic countries then of course they invest in foreign media there are advertisements in new york times or washington post and and so that means chinese government is basically paying uh, foreign uh, media uh, organizations and so if someone is paying you obviously you try to avoid the negative coverage and try to increase the positive coverage so in all these ways china is using media diplomacy now the i want to end with the calculation of soft power how, how how do you know what is china's soft power how is it in comparison with other countries so one way to do that is through indices so what in indices what you do is you create different parameters and then give some points to each of these parameters and then with an equation you bring all that together and calculate the answer and through that you can get a particular figure and then you can rank the countries according to the score so the first soft power index was created by jonathan mclory in 2010 so that was the ifg monocle soft power index and then he went on to create soft power 30 the same person okay and and so in both of this if you compare china is within the top 30 but it is quite below the united states which is number 1 2 3 something like that uh for say you can see 4 and 5 here us has fallen because donald trump was the president then uh, he has stopped doing this and uh, there's a new soft power index by brand finance which gives china a better score after covid you see there there had been a fall in the rating of course these ratings are not really scientific these are just estimations quickly i'll show you some others for example this is the pew research uh, which is showing the favorability of china and us in different countries say uk australia japan india russia brazil these are the quad and and brics countries so if you look at the figures you can see that uh, in most countries us is more popular than china except in russia where china is more popular than and uh, and and uh, china is the least popular in japan it is the lowest point here this is the the line shows the difference between the two then this is a figure showing soft power 30 uh, ratings of 2016 so the top countries are us and the western countries also japan is there and russia and china come in top 30 but towards the towards the lower position because there are some biases also in these ratings which I, i don't have time to discuss today so so let's leave it there and then this is the global soft power index we can represent it in a map so the dark country, the countries which are marked darker have higher ratings us and china and um, as they gradually as they grow lighter the ratings are lower okay so so i stop here so we have completed uh, 20 lectures in uh, to the in the introduction to chinese uh, studies i hope you found these lectures useful uh, please listen to them and uh, know more about china thank you